So we've been using rules of differentiation pretty liberally. We knew that we would one day, and the day is today, have to justify them. So here are the rules that we've used. And the first one, we didn't even give a second thought, and I think that's justifiable. And that would be the sum rule. All right, so the first rule of differentiation is that the derivative of a sum equals the sum of the individual derivatives. This is completely straightforward. We will actually show more difficult properties. But of course, the importance of this one is that we couldn't do anything without it. But it also shows half of the fact that the derivative is a linear operator. That's what it means to be a linear operator, is that when, when you apply it to a sum, you can apply it to the individual elements and then add together the results. So that's one thing you can do with vectors. You can add them, and so we need the sum rule. There is another thing that you can do with vectors, and that's multiply them by a number. Multiply them by a scalar, I should say, because it doesn't have to be a constant number. It can be a variable number, so it can be a variable scalar. So I'll write it like this. Here is something that you can do with vectors, absolutely. It's a product, and so we need a product rule for this. We actually haven't encountered a combination like this yet, but of course we will. And so for this there will be a product rule, which if you think about it is not at all obvious. This is an entirely different animal from a scalar function. A scalar function is a number, number to number, mapping. The sort of thing you're 100% familiar with, and that's what you studied in calculus this whole time. This is a totally different animal. It's an arrow. You have to do geometric constructions to work with it. There are no components. Have you appreciated that? No coordinate systems yet. And maybe not for a while if I can help it. And then, of course, I wouldn't be able to help it. And that's the beauty of it. So you know exactly what it'll be. OK, so here's the product rule. We could justify it, but we'll go for even bigger fish. So importantly, special case, when f of alpha is a constant, just c, just imagine that this is c v alpha, then this term drops out because the derivative of c is 0, and this just becomes c v prime alpha. And so these two expressions combined, and identities combined, tell you that the derivative is a linear operator. To be a linear operator, you basically need to satisfy the distributive law. That's what it means to be linear. And I broke it up into two portions because I wanted to focus on the product rule. But with that special case where f of alpha is a constant, the, this combined with this gives us, give us the full-fledged distributive law. And therefore, the derivative is a linear operator. Great. What else can you do with vectors? You can add them. You can multiply them by numbers, and of course you can dot them. That's what we're all about. Okay, and of course you can dot them. So there needs to be a differentiation rule for that. Here it is. Here is the rule that we used. Here is the rule that we used five minutes ago. All of these need to be justified because all of these apply to the sorts of objects that calculus did not deal with at all. And of course, ordinary calculus has arguments for why all of these hold. And so we have to make sure that those arguments carry over to the case of vector functions. And as I was saying that, I remember that, of course, there is one other very important rule the chain rule. So let's think about what the chain rule would look like. So the chain rule applies to a composition of functions. One function, you plug it into another function. And if you think about the logistics of what's going on, you realize that that inner function cannot be a vector. So we have vector-valued functions here, vector-valued, and scalar-valued. And there is no such thing as a vector variable. 
We only have single parameter variables. So when we attempt to write down the chain rule, we realize that this inner function just needs to be a scalar function and can be, this guy cannot be a vector function because there's just no such thing. So the chain rule would apply to something like this. Okay, you know exactly what the chain rule will look like. It will be the derivative of v, and here I will speak it as I'm saying it because it's very important the words you use. It will be the derivative of v evaluated at f of alpha. I feel that the word evaluated as is extremely important because otherwise, if you just say it, v prime of f of alpha, or worse yet, the derivative of v with respect to f, you know that awful way of writing it in calculus, dv df, df d alpha, awful way of writing, which makes it seem like we're differentiating a function v, vector valued function, with respect to the function f, which is total nonsense. You don't take derivatives with respect to functions. You only take derivatives with respect to the one independent variable that you have. So here, v is just a function of alpha. And all we did was plug in f of alpha for alpha. And so what, what this is, is the derivative of that simple function v of just one parameter, where we once again plugged in f of alpha for whatever the independent variable for v was. So it's v prime, a well-defined function, tangent to whatever curve v of alpha describes, v prime evaluated at f of alpha times the derivative of f of alpha. Okay, so homework, homework, we'll do this now, homework. Let's just show, we're not rediscovering America here. What we're doing is just making sure that whatever argument you ever use in the calculus carries over to the case of vectors, that vectors are mathematical enough that all the arguments carry over. We kind of suspect that they're mathematical enough. You can subtract them, you can divide them by h, you can measure distances between them, that means you can take limits. So all of that uh, leads us to believe that the argument will work, but let's just make sure. So let me give you two arguments. One that you should pretty much think that relies on one term Taylor series, and the other one just a little bit more careful if you don't want to deal with Taylor series or even just a linear series. And sometimes there are good reasons to do that. So, here's what the rule is. Here is a function. It's a scalar function. The dot product is a scalar function of alpha. This is not a scalar function of alpha. This is not a scalar function of alpha. But once we dot them, it's a scalar function of alpha. We're evaluating its derivative. It will equal the limit of the ratio of this evaluated of at alpha plus h minus this evaluated at alpha divided by h. Okay, so this is this function evaluated at alpha plus h. Great. Subtract from it the value of the function evaluated at alpha. Divided by h. That's the limit we need to evaluate. Now here comes the insightful Taylor series approach. The way a physicist would do it. Or at least think about it. A physicist would both think about it this way and do it this way. A mathematician will think about it this way, but then do it a slightly different way. So, here's what it is. We haven't really talked about it, but a vector function at alpha plus h can also be approximated by its value at alpha times h times the value of its derivative. So I will just write it. I think it's fair to keep the equality sign because there's a limit. But here's what we'll have. We have this is our one-term Taylor series approximation. This value right here approximately equals this. As much as we need equals this. 
I think I've said enough about that. Times, the same thing for V. I think this is the best way to think about it. As a series approximation. I wouldn't even use the word approximation. I would just use the word series representation minus this term right here divided by h. Good. Now, let's just, without even writing it out, talk about what will happen when you multiply this out. When you multiply this out, you'll have u prime, excuse me, u of alpha dotted with v of, with v of alpha. That cancels this constant term with respect to h. Then we'll have u prime, u prime dotted with v plus u dotted with v prime multiplied by h. That's where the h will cancel, plus a term proportional to h squared. The small term, the little o term. So when you divide by h, you'll still be left with h, a multiple of h, a factor of h. And then when you take the limit as h goes to 0, that term will go to 0. So to review, cancels. The term proportional to h, which will cancel this h, is u prime v plus u v prime, which is exactly what we want, plus a term that will go to zero in the limit. Okay, good. So we're left with u prime dotted with v plus u dotted v with v prime QED. So what you just saw was just a demonstration that ideas from calculus as applied to ordinary functions of one variable carry over to vector valued functions. And just for completeness, so we don't have to use this approximate Taylor series or be involved with series at all. Let me just, and, and once again to show that uh, ideas and calculations from calculus carry over to vector calculus just show you how a mathematician would have done it. So here is the trick. Okay, are you guys ready for the trick that will avoid my having to say the word series and approximation and all of that? This will be an exact argument. So we'll start from here. Okay, and here's what we'll do. I'll add a term and subtract a term and it'll be a very clever term so that I'll pair it up with this one and I'll pair it up with this one. I'll, between the two terms that cancel each other, I'll put one with this one and one with this one. Here, here's what it is. Now check this out. I will subtract u of alpha plus h dotted with v of alpha. Do you see how I, what I did here was I threw in a term that has alpha plus h on u, but not on v. So that term is not in the mix. I subtracted it. Now I'll make up by adding it. And now the remaining term minus u of alpha dotted with v of alpha. Now do you see what's about to happen? I will group this term with this one and this term with this one. And do you see what will happen here? Here you can factor out u of alpha plus h. Let me do that. Now I realize I, I should have kept plus h on v and not on u, but it doesn't matter. Plus, here we're going to factor out v of alpha. And now you see exactly what's happening. Here we have this term divided by h in the limit that equals v prime of alpha. This term in the limit equals u of alpha, no derivative, u of alpha. And this is v prime of alpha. So the first term converges to u dotted with v prime. And here, I'll combine this with the h, 
and in the limit this will be u prime of alpha dotted with v. And so you see that if, if I prepared for my lectures, I would have left the u plus h on v. And then I would get these terms in the right order. I would have u prime v plus u v prime. So, but here I got them in the opposite order, so let me rewrite them in the right order. And so the product rule is justified. I'll have to be honest with you, there's, a, there's another way to justify the product, the product rule, which never mentions limits. And that's something we prefer, as we talked about it last time, because you worked on your limits once, you've worked everything out, and then you want to continue using just the finite rules of differentiation and never think about infinitesimal arguments or limits again. So that way would be to choose a coordinate system, choose a basis, decompose everything you're working with with respect to that basis, and then now you have components. And components are scalar functions, they satisfy the product rule. And so doing it this way, take this quantity, write it in component form, oh, you'll still need the product rule. No, you won't because vectors are constant, uh, bases, base, basis vectors are constant vectors, you won't need the product rule. It will all be nice and clean. You'll apply the product rule to the components of the vectors, which is ordinary calculus and therefore doesn't require any further justification. And then you'll come back to the vector calculus world. You'll come back to the vector calculus world and these will just appear automatically. Okay, so uh, I prefer not to use components for as long as possible. That's why I use this approach and another, and the other nice thing is what I mentioned. It shows how most of the ideas from calculus, you can see that this is not specific to vector calculus. I, I learned this when I was studying calculus at your age. You know, but vectors are algebraic enough and similar enough to scalars algebraically that uh, most of the ideas carry over. Even to things like dot products. A dot product is not a product in the classical sense. There are many differences between an ordinary product of scalar quantities and vector product. There's no such thing as associativity. You cannot dot multiply three vectors. There are many differences. But there are enough similarities that you still call it the dot product. And many of those similarities you saw right here. Right? It satisfies the distributive property and on and on and on. So there's enough similarity that you can call it the dot product. And as it turns out, just enough similarity, or maybe plenty enough similarity, for all of the ideas from ordinary calculus, or enough ideas from ordinary calculus, to carry over to vectors. 